Well, hey, everybody. Today, we are talking about vitamin D deficiency, common symptoms, and solutions. And this is a really big topic because roughly 75 to 80% of our society is deficient in vitamin D, and vitamin D plays such a critical role in a wide variety of things. And that's what we're going to focus on today is what vitamin D does in our body. We're also going to talk about warning signs that you may be dealing with this vitamin D deficiency. We're going to talk about the best foods, sun care strategies, and supplement strategies to optimize your vitamin D. We're also going to talk about genes and how they actually can relate with the conversion of vitamin D. We're going to talk about a condition called vitamin D resistance and the nutrients that are involved in that, as well as genes. We're going to talk about some of the studies associated with vitamin D resistance linking it to things like autoimmune and chronic inflammatory conditions. And we're going to talk about how to measure and improve vitamin D resistance. So if you're dealing with that, you know, if you've been supplementing, doing your best to optimize your vitamin D, but it's just not budging, we're going to talk about what we need to do. And we're going to talk about all the best measurements. So there's more than just your 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 level that you can look at to see how well your body is metabolizing and utilizing vitamin D. So I'm going to go through that in this presentation. And so of course, this video is not meant to diagnose, treat, or cure any medical condition. And it's for informational purposes only. The video is not a treatment protocol and does not replace a consultation with a healthcare practitioner. You are fully responsible for what you do or don't do with the information in this presentation. So with that said, again, 75 to 80% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D3. And that's not even looking at optimal levels. I mean, opt, if we're looking at optimal levels, I mean, it's going to be 90, 95% unless they are supplementing with vitamin D. And so, you know, you're at much higher risk if you are not getting sun, if you are obese, obese people need more sun exposure, more supplementation in order to optimize their vitamin D. If you're pregnant, elderly, if you have very dark skin, then you're going to need more vitamin D. And it has been linked to things like cancer, heart disease, mental health disorders, colds and flus, kidney disease, diabetes. And it just plays a critical role. We used to think it was mostly for bone health. Now we realize it's a critical part of the immune system and it helps keep inflammation under control. It's critical for brain function, producing the right amount of neurotransmitters, circadian rhythm for good sleeping patterns. Um, weight management, helping balance out insulin, leptin, cortisol, all your different fat burning and fat storage hormones, important for your digestive system. So really every system of your body depends on vitamin D. It's really improperly named. It should be called a pro-hormone because it really has more of a hormonal role, kind of like insulin, than it does a vitamin role. So we'll go through how that works uh, in this presentation. And so this is a, a detailed chart, but basically we, what we get from the sun is a form of pre-vitamin D3 from the UV light, and it's converted to 7-dehydrocholesterol, dehydro, you know, so it actually activates cholesterol, and it turns it into cholecalciparol, right? And then that goes to the liver, where there's an enzyme, 25-hydroxylase, which converts it into 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, which is what we typically measure on labs, right? Also called calcidiol. So that's what we're typically looking at is kind of that conversion, that first hydroxylase conversion in the liver. However, the active form of vitamin D is actually made in the kidneys, which convert the 25 hydroxy D3 into 125 hydroxy D3. So they add you know, another methyl group there. And it's 125 hydroxy, another hydroxy group on there at, at the one carbon and the 25 carbon um, <clears throat> for the D3. And so that is actually what interacts with the VDR receptor, the vitamin D receptor to actually have activity within the cell. So it's important that we understand those conversions. The 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 itself is not uptaken by the cell, it's actually the 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 that gets that really has most of the benefits um, interacting with the VDR receptor. And so when we're looking at different sources, we have vitamin D2 ergo calciferol, which oftentimes is 
what's used to fortify like milk and different foods, processed foods, <clears throat> and also the common prescription vitamin D is in the vitamin D2 form as well. Vitamin D3 is more is that form that's a lot better to consume because it only needs one hydroxylase uh, enzyme activity from the kidney there to be converted into the 125 hydroxy vitamin D3. So that's important to understand. And it's also important to test both the 25 hydroxy and the 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 again. We know vitamin D plays a critical role in joint health, um, hormonal balance, energy levels, mitochondrial function, cognitive health, all these things. In fact, we know these biophotons really charge up the mitochondria. And so vitamin D, your vitamin D status is a very, very critical factor in understanding how well your cells are producing energy, how well your mitochondria are functioning and operating in your body. We also know that your vitamin D levels help balance the immune system. We hear a lot about boosting the immune system, but we don't want the immune system to be overreacting. That would be something like an autoimmune issue or chronic inflammation or allergenic type reaction. And at the same time, we don't want an underreaction. Then you're more susceptible to an infection, to developing diseases like cancer, hepatitis, HIV, shingles, things like that, TB. So we want a balanced and optimized immune system. And vitamin D really plays a critical role in how that works. In fact, the vitamin D receptor has been shown to modulate your T cell and your B cell behavior. In fact, according to a 2015 study published in Nutrients, and there's been many studies, calcitriol, uh, which again is the 125 hydroxy version, can regulate the T cells and promote an anti-inflammatory response through anti-inflammatory T regulatory cells, so the T regs. <clears throat> On top of that, it also helps with mast cell inhibitory effects. We hear a lot about histamine intolerance and mast cell um, uh, destabilization and uh, issues with mast cells, right? And so we know that uh, according to a study in the archives of dermatology research, calcitriol may inhibit the effects of mast cells uh, and decrease histamine release, histamine intolerance and inflammation. So that's very important to keep our immune system balanced again. So any sort of mast cell dysfunction is a sign of an, a dysfunctional immune activity. It also helps activate the CYP3A4 uh, gene, which is the most abundant cytochrome P450 liver enzyme and plays an important role in metabolism and hormonal health. So it really helps to detoxify bad estrogens, chemicals, different things like that in the body. So if we don't have good vitamin D, we're not going to have good liver detoxification. And speaking on that, it also helps with bile acid formation. According to a 2008 study published in the Journal of Lipid Research, lithocholic acid, a bile acid, can activate the VDR. So bile flow and vitamin D play a very important role together. They work together. <clears throat> Dopamine pathway activation. 2015 study published in Neuroscience showed that calcitriol and VDR activation play a role in dopamine pathway activation. So what that means is basically dopamine really helps us with the get up and go, right? So motivation, um, drive to accomplish goals, but also when our dopamine pathways are low, not only for some individuals, they respond with kind of an apathy and a lack of motivation. Other people get develop addictive behaviors. So very important that we're optimizing our dopamine pathways. Vitamin D plays a critical role there. Also in neural growth and integrity, testosterone levels for overall fertility, and then of course regulates calcium and phosphate metabolism as well. So very important roles that it plays. When it comes to cancer cells, when we're looking at this, we know that cancer cells have certain characteristics that vitamin D helps break down, right? So it helps stop cell proliferation. It helps enhance cell differentiation, which is important because in, in cancer, the cells lose their differentiation, right? So they all kind of start to clump together and actively grow and they don't have like a turnoff switch. So vitamin D helps activate apoptosis, 
stops blood flow going to the tumors, which is called angiogenesis, right? So it inhibits that, decreases the metastatic potential, which is the ability for the cancer cells to spread throughout the body to other regions of the body, and also activates the immune system, which again, activates those macrophages and different things like that to go out and to break down these cancer cells. So very important anti-cancer defense, lots of research on that. Also very important for brain function, not only for circadian rhythm, which is you know, a really great place to start, really helps you know, getting sunlight during the day, helps optimize your circadian rhythm. And that's very important, but also it helps spur nerve cell growth in the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain responsible for forming, organizing, and storing memories. It also impacts the super uh, chiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus and the pineal gland and triggers nerve growth and regulation in those areas. That helps us form and store new memories. It balances cortisol, serotonin, dopamine regulation. So we have mood improvements during the day and improves our melatonin production at night for restful sleep. So there's so much benefit that we get from getting regular sun exposure and helping optimize our vitamin D levels. Here are 10 signs, 10 symptoms that you may have. So let's say you've not been diagnosed with a chronic disease, but you're just not feeling your best. Here are 10 symptoms that are common with vitamin D. So depression, sleepiness, just feeling a lot of daytime sleepiness, greater pain sensitivity. So if you're noticing that small things seem to really irritate you and cause more pain, mood issues. So whether it's, again, depression, we talked about anxiety, right? Um, OCD, different things like that can all be related to vitamin D. Cause again, it plays a critical role in these neural pathways and really building um, optimal uh, neuroplasticity in our brain. Also high blood pressure is very, very common. You know, we, we hear about high blood pressure being more common in African-Americans. And one of the main reasons is because they're so dark and they're living inside now, they're not getting enough sun to, to produce enough vitamin D. So optimizing vitamin D plays a really critical role in keeping blood pressure under control improving endurance. You know, if you just feel like you're out of gas and uh, again, exhaustion, fatigue, you got to look at vitamin D, stress fractures or bone fractures in general, frequent illnesses and learning disorders. So if you're getting cold, sick, you know, fevers, flus, colds, things like that often, oftentimes vitamin D deficiency, and then children with learning disorders, very, very common to have vitamin D deficiencies. So that needs to be addressed there as well. Now, for your 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is very easy test to get for your doctor to, to order, you know, we're looking at anything over 50. You know, we want 50 nanograms per milliliter or above as really being a good level. Excess is considered over 100, although I really haven't seen any sort of, and, and I know a lot of people that, a lot of uh, practitioners that super high dose their patients. And they do not see any sort of unwanted side effects until their levels are up over 150 nanograms per milliliter. However, because we don't have enough research on that yet, <clears throat> we typically say the upper level is about 100. Again, although I'm not overly concerned unless it's up over 150. And you really have to supplement with high doses for a long period of time, like up over 20,000 nanograms or 20,000 international units of vitamin D3 in order to get it up over a hundred, you've got to do like 20,000 for months at a time, really to get it up that high. So, you know, and just getting sun exposure, you're not going to get it up that high. The optimal therapeutic level, level, like if you're dealing with an autoimmune condition or cancer or something like that, many researchers believe it's between 70 and a hundred nanograms per milliliter. So in that range. Now, if you look at your typical lab, they're not going to flag it as low unless it's under 30 nanograms per milliliter. So you might be 33, which to me is deficient as a functional practitioner. I'm looking at that and I'm saying, wow, we really need to improve vitamin D. However, your doctor may look at it and say, oh, your vitamin D is great. So if you've been told your vitamin D is good, but you don't know your number, you really want to know and understand your numbers. So it's a very important test to get, and you should understand your number. Now, here's your sun exposure guide. So fair skinned people, so like the Scandinavians, um, you know, British, people like that, 
they don't need a whole lot of sun in the, in the summer, 10 minutes. You know, I really like 10, 20 minutes, you know, for, for very fair skin people. Obviously there's some individuals, a lot of redheads <clears throat> that are very pale skin that burn very quickly. So we don't want to burn obviously, but we want like a light pinkening of the skin. That's good. That's a sign that we're getting that stress response. We're getting enough UVB rays to get the stress response to produce vitamin D. So in the spring and autumn and in the winter, you need more sun exposure, which you know is very, very hard to do. And this is why vitamin D supplementation is so important. Also, depending on where you live, like in the United States, if you are living really like above, <clears throat> above Atlanta in the wintertime, you're not, the UVB rays, you're not gonna get enough of them, even if it's warm out, to get enough vitamin D uh, synthesis, right? It's not, it's not enough UVB rays to produce, to activate the vitamin D synthesis. So you really have to supplement during the wintertime. And other than the summertime, you really need to be supplementing. So for a lot of people, especially people that I know are getting out, they're sunbathing on a regular basis. They're going to the pool, the beach, whatever it is, they're going outside, working outside without their shirt on. You know, getting a good amount of sun exposure, like 40% of your body or more exposed to sun, I'll just tell them not to supplement during the summertime, but then to supplement the other parts of the year. It's also a good idea if you're able to, to get away in the wintertime and go to Mexico or, you know, the Caribbean or something like that. If you're able to do this and get some sunbathing. Now, again, you don't want to burn, but just get out, get a lot of good sun exposure to optimize your vitamin D that time of year can be really, really helpful. And you can see people that are medium skinned and dark, very dark skinned African Americans, for example, need a lot more sun because our ancestry um, was exposed to a lot of sun. So they produced a lot of melanin, very, very, uh, you know, strong amounts of melanin in their skin as a natural sun screen, right? A natural sun repellent. So very important that we're doing our best to optimize sun exposure as much as we can. But for, you know, for many of us, we just can't get enough sun on a regular basis, on a daily basis to optimize our vitamin D levels. Now, there are some foods that you can consume, salmon and fatty fish, about 100 I use per ounce. Now, you got to think about it. Typical person, I want them supplementing with about 1,000 international units per 25 pounds of body weight to optimize their levels. So 1,000 I use per 25 pounds of body weight. So you know, just to get 1,000 IUs of vitamin D from fish, you need about 10 ounces, right? 10 ounces of, excuse me, of fish for that. You need 50 ounces to get 5,000 international units. That's a lot of fish. It's really hard to get from food. Now, chicken or beef liver, 25 to 50 IUs. Egg yolk, 20 to 40 IUs. Grass-fed butter's got a little bit, 7.2 IUs per tablespoon. Cheese, and then mushrooms are the best vegetable source, one IU, right? So you're not going to optimize your levels by just, you know, eating mushrooms all day. It's just very, very small amounts, but every little bit counts, right? Every little bit helps. And uh, so getting some from food is important as well. Now let's talk a little bit about vitamin D resistance, a 2021 article published in Frontiers in Immunology found that vitamin D resistance may be the underlying cause of autoimmunity. Researchers looked at the vitamin D serum markers of autoimmune patients, where even high one-time doses of supplementation made a, made a little difference. In one study, they looked at, at about 55 to 62% of patients responded well to vitamin D supplementation. So they gave them a real high dose, <clears throat> and 55 to 62% of these people felt better, right? They had better markers on labs, but some of them didn't obviously, right? And it turns out that while many patients are very responsive to vitamin D supplements, others respond very little or not at all at the same dose. The authors of the paper suggest that vitamin D resistance may be the culprit. And in these cases, larger doses of vitamin D may downregulate the immune system. The paper suggests that many of the same factors that can result in chronic health issues may also cause vitamin D resistance. One of these issues is a genetic predisposition to polymorphism. So there are several different gene mutations that may be playing a role that we'll go through here in just a minute. 
Um, other environmental factors, including, you know, not obviously not getting enough sunlight, different toxins, pathogens may also increase the risk of vitamin D resistance. This may interfere with the enzyme activity necessary for the conversion of vitamin D from inactive to active. It may interrupt vitamin D transport across the body. It may impact the job of, vit of the vitamin D receptor, the VDR, and other receptors to allow the body to use and store vitamin D. Interference with VDR receptors is the most common issue. Um, so a lot of infections, for example, will, will block the ability of the VDR receptor to uptake the vitamin D. So that can oftentimes be the case. However, any problems within the system may interfere with your body's ability to achieve optimal vitamin D levels. The paper also discussed the role of VDR-related pathogens in vitamin D resistance and autoimmunity. We've long known that viruses and other pathogens can trigger autoimmunity and other chronic diseases. Pathogens can also interrupt vitamin D signaling, pointing out a missing link between infections and autoimmune disease. So, you know, it's almost like the pathogens know that vitamin D plays such a critical role. So they block our body's ability to be able to utilize it, which keeps our immune system weak and suppressed. The author suggests that testing for vitamin D is important, but it's not enough to de determine vitamin D resistance. This is why we want to look at parathyroid hormone levels. We want to look at 125 vitamin D. We want to look at magnesium. There's a number of things that we're going to go through that we have to understand uh, as we're looking at this. And so here are some other factors that are involved in low vitamin D. Of course, skin type, we know having darker skin can lower your body's ability to absorb UV light. Um, if you're wearing sunscreen, skin covering, right? If you're covering your skin, this is why, you know, to optimize your vitamin D, you really want as much of your body exposed as possible particularly like areas where there's more fat, you tend to absorb it better. So, you know, your face, your hands, not as much fat as, you know, like your chest, your, your belly areas like that, your arms. So it's better to get, you know, a good amount of your body exposed. That's important. Um, breastfeeding, you know, so that's, uh, you know, when you're breastfeeding as a woman breastfeeding, she's actually creating vitamin D for her baby. So she needs more vitamin D when she's breastfeeding. So that's important as well. Different genetic polymorphisms that we're going to go through um, that play a role as well. Again, we talked about if you're obese, okay, or if you've had a weight loss surgery, right? So if you had like your stomach stapled or something like that, um, you may need more vitamin D. Hyperparathyroidism. So if you're if you have high parathyroidism, actually, I'll talk about that later. We'll come back to that. So all these things are just so important. There's a lot of different factors that play a role. You know, you can see here kidney and liver disease because we know that the kidneys and the liver are where we're converting 25 hydroxy or we're creating 25 hydroxy vitamin D in the liver and we're converting it to 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 from in the kidneys, right? So that's important. Statin drugs, right? Certain drugs like statins, for example, as well as laxatives, steroids, seizure medications, um, tuberculosis, TB medications, and uh, different weight loss medications. And definitely statins are one of the big ones. Your cholesterol lowering medications will reduce your ability to absorb vitamin D. So very important stuff. Now let's look at some of the genes uh, in this process. So we know we've got inactive vitamin D3. We've got colcalciferol, um, you know, absorbed from the, the, the sun or, you know, oftentimes taken in supplementation form. And then we have this enzyme CYP2R1 in the liver, which uh, is used to create the 25 hydroxy D calcidiol, which is a storage form. Okay. And then we have got another enzyme called CYP27B1 that's necessary to convert it, help convert that process. And with the uh, hydroxylase enzyme, to that creates the hydroxylase enzyme to in the in uh, the kidney to activate it to 125 hydroxy vitamin D3. So that's important. And then we also have a binding protein, the GC binding protein, which helps to get the 125 hydroxy D3 over to the vitamin D receptor to activate the gene receptor. Okay. And on top of that, you know, so we we also have 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 again activates vitamin D activity in the cell. So the gene expression 
through a couple enzymes, SNAI2 and PIM1. And there's also, you need vitamin A to really activate the nucleus in the cells. Vitamin A activates the VDR targets. So now vitamin D's activity in the cell is regulated by vitamin A and enzymes that are dependent upon vitamin A in the cell. So we need good vitamin A as well. So any sort of polymorphisms or problems in these enzymes can result in poor, um, poor conversion and activation, poor conversion of vitamin D and activation of the VDR receptor. So parathyroid hormone uh, is very important as well because that works to maintain calcium and phosphorus levels. A high PTH, okay, so in a, like a case of hyperparathyroidism, parathyroid means around the thyroid. So this is a gland that regulates calcium and phosphorus and it lives right around the thyroid, right on the sides of the thyroid. And it inhibits the hydroxylation of 25-hydroxy-D to the active 125-hydroxy-D in the liver. I'm sorry, in the kidneys. So that takes place in the kidneys. It, it inhibits that. And this is because parathyroid hormone is all about increasing calcium uptake in the kidneys. So if calcium levels are too low, parathyroid sends out hormone, which causes a release of calcium from the bones. Vitamin D, one of its roles is absorbing, getting calcium into the bones, right? So it needs to reduce the activity of vitamin D. If you have hyper or if you have if you have parathyroid hormone it reduces the activity of vitamin d so if you have too much parathyroid hormone hyper parathyroid hormone you're typically going to see high calcium in the blood over 10.4 milligrams per deciliter you're going to see high pth levels above 65 pg per milliliter and you're also going to see low 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 levels. So you may see normal or high 25 hydroxy vitamin D might look good, but you'll see low 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And this is why it's important to kind of test these together to really make sure you're getting the your most accurate understanding of what's happening in your body. Now, we talked about pathogens and toxins affecting vitamin D activation. Absolutely. Some of the ones that have been most well studied here are Epstein Barr or EBV, right? Epstein Barr's got a big association with, for example, like Hashimoto's, uh, which is a Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a autoimmune condition affecting the thyroid gland causing hypothyroidism. So it's associated with that. And a 2010 study published in Cell Molecular Life Sciences found that EBV can result in VDR inactivation. So Epstein-Barr is associated with a lot of different um, autoimmune conditions, and it can also block VDR activation. Cyto, cytomegalovirus, another one, um, and this one has been, uh, can also cause a downregulation in your VDR receptors, right? So the overall amount of VDR receptors can go down. Also Lyme, Lyme can also very much affect this. You also have electrosmog. According to a 2017 study published in immunology research, electrosmog, such as Wi-Fi radiation, may result in VDR dysfunction and contribute to autoimmunity. So it's one of the mechanisms for why some people are very sensitive to, to uh, electromagnetic frequencies because they can block or cause dysfunction in the VDR receptor. Um, gliotoxins. Gliotoxins are produced by molds right? So they're part of molds, candidas, yeast, things like that. And they can also interfere with VDR uh, expression. So very important stuff to understand. So if we have a lot of exposure to these things, it can affect our ability to uh, uptake, absorb that vitamin D. We might need higher doses. Obviously, we want to dampen down the, uh, the infections as well, right? So utilizing different herbs and different compounds, we can dampen down those infections while we further support our vitamin D. Now, magnesium also plays a critical role here. So magnesium plays a role in all elements of vitamin D absorption and conversion, right? So the initial 25 hydroxylase, it plays a role there, plays a role in the production of, um, you know, the, 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 the pre-vitamin D3 that's 
um, created between cholesterol and sun exposure. Magnesium plays a role there, plays a role in the conversion from 25 hydroxy D into 125 hydroxy D, um, and the activation of VDR as well. So it plays a role in, in all the different elements of vitamin D um, conversion and activation. So magnesium, very important role, right? As you can see. So let's look at functional blood testing analysis for vitamin D activity. So instead of just looking at your 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, which, which is a good starting place. If you're not testing that, you should know that number. And it should ideally be between 50 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. Again, if it's a little over 100, 120 or something like that, I'm not overly concerned. If somebody is over that level, usually I'll have them take like a month off of supplementation and then we'll go back on the supplement, right? Usually something like that. 125 hydroxy calcitriol. Uh, we also want to look at that. We really should be, you know, pretty much greater than or equal to the 25 hydroxy D3 with our 125 hydroxy, right? And most people are not looking at that level, but that's actually the active form coming from the kidney that's activating the VDR. So if we see that the calcitriol, right, that 125, if if it is lower than the 25 hydroxy D3. We need to consider possibly hyperparathyroidism or possibly an infection or EMF exposure or a CYP24A1 gene mutation as well, right? That we can be looking at there too. So magnesium, when you're looking at blood magnesium, serum magnesium should be 2.0 milligrams per deciliter or above, although that's not really a great measurement of magnesium uh, sufficiency that's a good starting place, right? It's a starting place that we can look at when it comes to blood. PTH should be between 15 and 65, okay? So in hypoparathyroidism, right? We can have issues there as well. So we can oftentimes see very low levels of calcium in that case. Um, and, you know, so then vitamin D will go down because calcium is very low, but we are not able to produce enough parathyroid hormone to bring up the calcium. So the body will just start to not, not make vitamin D. So too low hypoparathyroidism can cause vitamin D deficiency as well as too much or hyperparathyroidism. So we want to look at that calcium levels, you know, 9.2 to 10.1 to make sure that we're not kind of creeping into an issue with PTH or parathyroid, uh, parathyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, hypo. So we look at that vitamin A, vitamin A is also something you can test. Again, that has to do with activating or working with the vitamin D in the cell, right? So now the VDR receptor is activated. Vitamin A plays a role in the enzymes that are activated that help vitamin, the VDR um, with its cellular activity. So vitamin A should be between 35 and 60 UG per deciliter. So if we're vitamin A deficient, we're not going to be able to perform the functions of vitamin D. So another good thing to be able to look at. So very important stuff. Um, and so we want to make sure, again, all these things are in balance. Other labs we should consider are liver enzymes. You know, if the liver's really damaged, we're not going to get that conversion into 25-hydroxy D3. Also the kidneys. So we look at GFR, glomerular filtration rate as well as BUN and total protein to look for issues with liver and kidney function or malabsorption issues, right? So if we have gut issues, celiac disease, and we're not absorbing, you know, that could be another factor if we're trying to supplement, but we can't absorb. So this is what we look at in functional medicine. This is why, how we look at the full picture to see what's going on. Not every person is the same. And, you know, just looking at one lab range is not enough to really understand what's happening in that person's body. It's definitely a lot better than what most people are doing, just knowing your 25 hydroxy D3, very good stuff. But you should also, you know, want to understand what's happening in these other levels as well. And, you know, people ask me all the time, is should should I get a vitamin D with K2 in it? Like, is that really important? Well, I'll tell you, to optimize your vitamin D, it's not important to take it with vitamin K2 to just optimize your vitamin D. You can just take D3 alone. However, K2 synergizes with vitamin D3 for optimal calcium metabolism. Why is that important? 
Because if we do are not getting calcium out of the blood and into the bones where it belongs in a normal, you know, at a normal ratio, you know, we need, we need a certain amount of calcium in the, in the blood for sure. Um, however, if we're not getting that out, it is going to accumulate and it's going to accumulate in plaques in our arteries, in our joints, you know, too much calcium causes a lot of different issues in the body. So joint degeneration, um, you know, damage to the endothelial lining and scarring and placking in our blood vessels, right? Our brain, right? Different areas like that. So if we want to slow down the aging process, aging is associated with calcification. So we want to slow down the aging process, doing our best to optimize calcium metabolism is important. And this is where K2 comes in, particularly the MK7 version of K2. It's the most bioavailable and bioactive form of K2. We want to take the D3 with the K2 together. Usually I recommend somewhere around 5,000 to 10,000 IUs of vitamin D and about 90 to 180 micrograms, micrograms of K2. Okay. In some cases, high dosing K2 can be, you know, a really powerful strategy, but for most people, you know, taking about that amount, 90 to 180 micrograms of K2 can have a great therapeutic effect on the body, right? So really good stuff to do. And also, you know, if you're interested in getting these kinds of labs, this is why we offer our comprehensive blood analysis, where we look in detail at what's happening with your vitamin A, your vitamin D, all the different tests I talked about, parathyroid hormone, magnesium. We're looking at all of that. Cardiovascular risk factors here. We're looking at inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, homocysteine, um, different things like that. We're looking at all your liver and kidney health markers, your thyroid hormone markers, zinc to copper levels, folate, B12, homocysteine, right? Plays a role in methylation, lipid panels in detail, right? We're looking at your urinary tract health, red blood cells and iron status, blood sugar and insulin. So it really goes through everything in detail. So, you know, if you're interested, you can check that out on our website and hopefully you guys really enjoyed this training. Uh, we went deep on vitamin D. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that and we'll see you guys on a future online training. Be blessed.